Good morning. Hi, Ellie. Thank hi. you. Yeah, hi. Thank you for coming and joining me this morning and, um, and for uh, taking part in this conversation about how stress can affect us at any time in our lives, but particularly during pregnancy and when we're rearing very small children. And I'm just going to explain a little bit about the science that sits behind that, and then I'll come back to you to ask you to talk about your experience. So uh, what we know about the science of stress is that there are three different levels of stress. There's the positive stress, the, the normal healthy part of life, the stress that both Ellie and I experienced this morning, getting our cars into the car park and registering properly uh, at reception and so on. And when we experience uh, that level of stress, we, we notice that we might get a bit sweaty or our pulse rate might go up a bit, we might feel a bit tense, but we can regulate ourselves back to feeling calm quite quickly. And perhaps the, a nice way of describing this is with something called the hand model, which a um, doctor in America put together called Dan Siegel. And in the hand model, when, the brain, when our brains are working really well and we're connecting and communicating well and we're relaxed and we're making our most effective decisions, uh, in, this, in this metaphor, our brain looks like this. But then sometimes when a stress comes along, we may, um, we may react like this. So the reactive center, the emotion center here in the downstairs part of the brain becomes reactive with the stress and our lid starts to flap and it can even get to the point when it flips but with that positive level of stress, that normal, healthy stress that's good for your baby and good for a, a small young child developing uh, for us to experience, then uh, we bring that. We are able to bring that lid down again and 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 communicate together like that. So Ellie and I are both like that. Uh, but sometimes we experience a higher level of stress, and this is um, a, a level that we would call tolerable stress. And in this instance our lid goes up and flaps, and it's more difficult for us to bring it down. So it's here a lot more of the time, and might go up there, but it comes down to here. And the way we bring it down is by having, uh, one of the ways that helps us bring that lid down is having people around us who are able to um, uh, talk, support us emotionally, to sit with us, to nurture us, to enable us to talk about how we're feeling and process those the feelings. And for young children and babies in the womb and very young children, having an adult caregiver, either a parent or um, a partner uh, around who's able to support, uh, support that person emotionally will help them bring their lid down. But then there's another level of stress, which is a toxic stress. And in this uh, situation, the stress goes on and on at a higher level. And as well as that, there isn't anybody around who can help either the pregnant mum or the mum um, with a very young baby bring her lid down. So she's up here a lot of the time. And I think, Ellie, that when you were pregnant, that's probably, that's the sort of level of stress that you experienced from what you said when we were chatting earlier. Yep. So I wonder if you can just describe how you noticed when you were at that tolerable level of stress and your lid was flapping a lot of the time or even flipping, how you noticed that and realised that you could do with some support or help? So for me, when I'm feeling stressed, um, I definitely find that it's much harder to communicate with people. Yeah. So I'll be isolating myself, not being able to communicate properly with my husband or with my friends. Um, I'm a teacher and teaching is extremely stressful anyway. Yeah. So when I was starting to feel those extra levels of stress, um, I would find it much harder to be able to do my job. Yeah, so generally communication um, would be a lot more difficult, so I find it difficult to say how I was feeling yeah. um, and maybe just maybe crying more easily yeah. or getting angry, just feeling much stronger emotions, yeah. um, but not able to explain why, so yeah. then other people can't understand that. Um, so yeah, it would cause arguments, it would cause disruption to relationships. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's actually what I hear commonly mm. as a GP at the start of all of this. And so it's interesting to hear that. If you take your mind back to it, can you remember any physical sensations that you had at that point? Um, yeah, so during my third pregnancy, I know when my anxiety and stress was really high, yeah. um, I was having palpitations. Yeah. Um, I ended up having to have a heart monitor on because they were a bit worried about how, how many what level of palpitations I was experiencing. Yeah. 
um, I'd feel very sweaty, yeah. um, just very anxious. I'd find it hard to keep my mind on the right subjects yeah. and not be able to concentrate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and again, those are very common things that we hear from um, when we feel when people feel stressed, and when, this is kind of when the stress goes on and on, isn't it? Yeah. And it's not relieved, and you're kind of here or here a lot of the time with that hand model. So, uh, can you just um, how do you actually help me help us all understand how you actually access that support? Did somebody suggest that talking therapies, for instance, might be helpful, or how did it happen that you got you accessed the support? I was. I was really fortunate that in my second pregnancy, around 16 weeks, when I started to feel um, some stress and anxiety, my community midwife picked up on it really quickly. Yeah. Um, she made a referral for me to a specialist midwife yeah. who was able, I was able to talk to about how I was feeling. And she then referred me to talking therapies. Okay. So although it is possible to self-refer or to be referred via your GP, for me, it was done through um, through the midwife. Yeah. But there's lots of different ways of being referred to talking therapies. So I felt it was really important to be able to um, share a bit of my experience because mental health issues bring so much stigma and shame anyway. And with maternal mental health, there's the added element of fear about what's going to happen to you and your child. Um, and I feel like people think that they should be really joyful and happy when yeah. they've just had a baby. And sometimes that isn't the case. I guess also I'd like to add, you know, that we need to get to a point where it's okay for the dads to ask for help or yeah. the partners or the other adult caregiver because I think sometimes that's really missed. And, you know, um, uh, there's no reason, you know, a dad can get depressed or mm -hmm. find it difficult with a very young baby just as much as the mum, in fact, really. It's slightly different because they haven't actually had the birth, obviously. But still, it can be very hard sometimes. Yeah. And I think, um, again, we need to take the stigma away from that, don't we? So that it can become okay and normal for a man to, um, to access talking therapies or other support at that point. I just want, I want people to understand that it is okay to ask for help. Yeah. Um, and not to be afraid of the consequences because there is help out there. Yeah. Um, whether it be um, more structured help or whether it's the peer support kind of help that I found through Mental Health Swims. So while I was on the mother and baby unit, one of the specialist doctors there um, told us that she'd been swimming in the sea. And it just rang a bell to me of something that I'd like to try. I'd heard before about how it was beneficial for mental health, but I'd never really tried doing it when the water's really cold. I'd obviously swum in the sea as a child and even as an adult, but not when it was really cold. Um, but the doctor put me in touch with a friend of hers who was a host of a group in Lyme Regis. Um, and then when I was discharged from the unit, I went along. And this was in um, February of 2021. And the water was at its absolute must coldest. Have been freezing, yeah. it was I can around just seven degrees. Now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, so the idea is that you you go and have a dip. It's not yeah. so much swimming, it's called Mental Health Swims, the organisation. Yeah. Yeah. But it's more about dipping in cold water. Yeah. So um, it's about community, not competition. Yes. And about uh, and dips, about, not distance. So and it's kind of that deep mindful experience, isn't it? That's, yeah. Uh, it's a bit like the um, heavy weighted blankets and things we sometimes use as, as part of sensory integration. Yeah. It's kind of just helps those uh, neural circuits all calm down. It's another way of bringing the lid down. It's, it's a wonderful incredible. thing to do. Yeah. It, it, the, the way you feel completely connected and alive when you're in that cold water. Yeah. Um, and you can go in with a wetsuit on or, you know, you can wear whatever you want in yes. the water. And I love that description of you going in with your bikini and then gloves and a, gloves and and a, bubble, and a hat. bubble hat. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's really... So mental health swims has been a huge, huge part of continuing my recovery. Yes. So I needed um, a period of time in the mother and baby unit just to stabilise me um, and to help me see how I could, how I can continue with life. And then being able to go in the water and have that peer support yes. as well. And I'm, I'm now a host for the um, Lyme Regis group too, I co-host it. And all of those things have just really empowered me. Yes, and, and it is wonderful, and it fits so well with the science as well, because you've discovered a way of, uh, that you can bring your lid down yeah. and that you can access yourself without needing to uh, you know, have a professional around. You, know, you can choose to go and join in with that yeah. community and, and, and all of you together 
uh, supporting each other, aren't you? Which is just, you know, really lovely on the one hand. But also it fits with how we are as humans. We Mm. like to be in groups. We like to feel as if we belong. And that sense of belonging that you described there, along with the deep mindful exercise of going in the water, is bringing your lid down, isn't it? And what we know from the science is that as parents, the more we can bring our lids down and, and, um, and, and, and sit, if you like, or flow in our river of well-being, the more our children are likely to be able to do that. So for me, being part of Mental Health Swims was really important as um, helping with my recovery, but obviously it's just one example of lots of different ways that we can access what you called your river, river of well-being. Yeah. For example, in the mother and baby unit, we did lots of creative activities and we did some gardening and things like that. Yeah. And some of those activities other people have found really, really helpful too. Yeah, and you're absolutely right. And um, I know when I'm talking with mums or with, um, you know, with older children as well, um, that finding time to do things like dot to dot colouring, mm. sometimes crochet, yeah. knitting, that kind of stuff. Actually, some of um, mums enjoy Lego yeah. and connects. It's funny, isn't it? Because you always think it's going to be the child. But in fact, sometimes doing that with the child can be a uh, very you know, mindful activity. The kind of stuff beyond... Um, talking therapies, which you which you can either self refer to or your um, health minister or midwife can refer you to, there's stuff beyond that will kind of happen as part of a process. I think that's fair to say, isn't it? That yeah. uh, once you're in talking therapies, if they feel you need more support, yep. they can manage that transfer into the perinatal mental mental health team or the maternal mental health team, as I think it's now called, and or the met- the mother and baby unit. But for any of you who want to find out more about that, we're going to put a series of links at the end of this chat so that you can easily access any more information that you'd like. Thank you. And thank you, Ellen.